Good morning. We're excited that you are here with us today uh, to join us in this morning worship here at Fountainhead Church of Christ. We're excited you are decided to come and or listen to us online. We appreciate you uh, listening to us. We hope you enjoy the service today. We appreciate everyone's uh, attention. It is Mother's Day, so we would like to wish all of our mothers a uh, happy Mother's Day. We do have several that need our prayers. Uh, we know we can't go visit them, but we can pray for them and call and check on them. Robert Fields, this is uh, Carolyn Spivey and Betty Fields' brother is in the hospital in Macon County. Sister Kendra Stevens is uh, not doing good at this time. She needs our prayers. Lynn Klein will be having treatments. Just remember her. Sue Anderson is at the waters. This is Carrie Poole's grandmother. Bill Lamb is having treatments. Uh, remember Johnny Tucker in our prayers. He is at home and is continuing to recover at home. Just remember Jamie Fleming's aunt, Sue Himes, uh, Emerald McDonald. Sue Clark is home and she's doing well. Bill Pruitt is in the hospital in Centennial and he is struggling a little bit, so let's make sure we remember him. Andrea Raglan is in the hospital at Knoxville. And James Shockley's nephew is in the hospital at Madisonville, Kentucky. He is improving. Uh, remind everybody that Derek sent out an email about the school supply giveaway. That's going to be July the 18th as we start to get back together and start doing things. Uh, let's remember this. Uh, he's going to start collecting the items for that so you can bring those to the building. And also the pantry items, if you can, if you want to bring anything for that, you can bring those to the building and they'll be taken care of. <clears throat> if you know anyone that needs help in any way, contact Bill McGuire and uh, he will see that that's taken care of. As we said last week, the elders have put together a plan for the congregation to begin worshiping together. And we do have some guidelines. And again, all this information will be sent out in an email later today. Starting next Sunday, May the 17th, and then on May the 24th and 31st, we will have worship only here at the building, but we will have two services, one at 9 a.m. and one at 10.30 a.m., and this will be split by alphabet. At 9 a.m., we're asking those families whose last name begins with A through McClellan to assemble for worship. We're asking that when services ends, this group needs to exit the building as quickly as possible so that the next group can start entering the building by 1015 for the 1030 worship. We're asking you to exit through the back door and through the office nursery exit. And we're asking that no one go down to the basement during this time. At 1030, we're asking those families whose last name begins with McCrory through Z to assemble for worship. The communion will be available on the table in the foyer as you enter, as well as the offering plate to drop off your contributions. We're asking that children to sit with their parents during worship. Please do not let your children go down to the basement as well. We respect and encourage your right to wear a mask and or gloves. We will follow the CDC guidelines as far as having seating six feet apart according to family units. Skip about six feet between each family. We will have alternating rows blocked off to help. After the 9 a.m. service, we will block the, the rows that had just been used and open up the ones that were not used. We'll do this for the 1030 service. All pews will be sprayed between the 9 a.m. service and the 1030 service. We want everyone to feel comfortable being here for worship. However, if you still feel uncomfortable being here, that's okay. The elders understand this. The live streams will still be available at 1030 starting May 17th. Uh, at 1030, it'll be live streamed on Facebook and Timothy is working on getting the YouTube live streamed as well and he will send out an email this week to let you know that that has happened. Please know that the elders love each of you, and even though we have a desire for us to be together and worship as a family, 
We also would like for you to do what you feel is the safest for you and your family. If you're sick or your immune system is vulnerable, please stay at home and worship with us by live stream. The communion pickup and offering drop-off will still be available through May on Fridays 8 to 12, Saturdays from 9 to 11, and 3 to 5. The elders do have a plan moving forward, and as we get into the month of June, we'll be sharing that with you in the coming weeks. We know we've had a lot of folks watching online, and we want you folks to come and worship with us. And you can come to either worship service starting next week. The elders want you to know just how much we love you and appreciate you. We all know this is not how we normally do things. And we're wanting to get back together and worship and things be as normal and as, do it as quick as possible. But we're asking that you have patience with us as we work to get back to worshiping together with no restrictions as a congregation. You know, when Jesus, or I'm sorry, when Paul was talking to the Ephesians in chapter 5 when he was telling the husbands and wives how to treat each other, he's, he compared the husbands to the church or to Jesus dying for the church. In verse 22, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that it might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Christ cared for the church so much that he died for it. He didn't die for a building. And the reason the church is so special is because of the people, of you and me. And all of you, our members, you've done an amazing job since all this has been going on. That's why the church is so special is because of the people. You've been sending cards, you've been calling, checking on people, helping each other, praying for each other. And the elders here want you to know that we appreciate you so much. We're grateful for you. We're humbled by your actions. And your encouraging words have been amazing to us and your Christ-like behavior. We can't wait to see you again next Sunday if you're able to be here. Let's go to God in prayer at this time. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day you've given us. We thank you for this first day of the week that we're able to come here to worship you. We thank you for the ability to have this service live streamed. We thank you for the technology we have. We thank you for Timothy and his willingness and ability to be able to put this out. We thank you for Matt and his ability to preach. Pray that you continue to bless him and Doug and Derek as they go about their work preaching and teaching your word. We thank you for our church here at Fountainhead. Thank you for each member. We pray that you'll be with them, that you'll bless them, your Lord, in their lives, that you will comfort them. We thank you for everything that we have going on here. We pray, dear Lord, as we get back together, we can do so safely, and our worship is pleasing to you. We pray for those that have been mentioned here today that are sick, having treatments. We pray that you'll be with them, be with the doctors that minister unto them, and if it be your will, dear Lord, they'll be back to their normal place in life. We pray for our country that this uh, virus is going on, dear Lord, that you could take it away from us, that we could get back to our normal life and be able to do things that are pleasing to you. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who came to this earth and died on the cross for our sins. And pray, dear Lord, that you forgive us when we do sin. It's in his name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing Nailed to the Cross in preparation for the Lord's Supper. There was one who was willing to die in my stead that a soul so unworthy might live. And the path to the cross 
He was willing to tread all the sins of my life to forgive. They are nailed to the cross. They are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear. With what anguish and loss, Jesus went to the cross. But he carried my sins with him there. As we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And we had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let's pray together for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity today to come here and partake of the Lord's Supper. We thank you for the great sacrifice that your son Jesus made for all of us for the forgiveness of our sins. We pray, dear Lord, that as we take this bread which represents the body of Jesus hung on that cross, that we would do so in a manner that's well-pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. pray for the cup. In like manner, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this cup, which to us as Christians represents Christ's blood shed on the cross for our sins. We pray as we partake, we would do so in a well-pleasing manner. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> At this time, we find it convenient to take up an offering. I'd like to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 9. It says, But this I say, who, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace amount towards you, and that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. It is written, He has dispersed abroad, He has given to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the lives that we have. You bless us in so many ways. We thank you for the health and the ability that you've given each one of us to be able to go out and make a living and take care of our families. We pray, dear Lord, that with the money that's been collected this week, that we will take it and take this offering and use it in a way that's pleasing in your sight. We pray that we can help those who go out and preach and teach your word, continue to help do that, and also help those in need. We pray that the money that we have here today will use it 
in a way that's pleasing to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Before Matt's lesson this morning, we're going to sing a couple of verses of Yield Not to Temptation. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some other to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus, he'll carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. To him that o'ercometh, God giveth a crown. Through faith we shall conquer. Though often cast down, He who is our Savior, our strength will renew. Look ever to Jesus, He'll carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. Amen. This morning comes from James chapter 2, verse 26, where the Bible says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Good morning, everyone. So thankful that you're able to join us this morning. I uh, want to continue the thought that Danny had uh, this morning on Happy Mother's Day. What a blessing you guys are to your family and to your children. I'm thankful for Aaron. I'm thankful for the mother that she is to my kids, and I'm very thankful uh, for my mom. I'm very thankful for my mom-in-law. I'm very thankful uh, for the things that they do for me and the encouragement that they have been to me over the years. You know, it reminds me of a story that I read the other day. It's about Benjamin West, a, a painter. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but... The story goes like this. As a young boy, he decided to draw a picture of his sister. He got out bottles of ink and he started to uh, make this picture. And he succeeded in making just a big old mess is what he made on the sheet. But when his mom got home, she went over to him and she said, What a beautiful picture. And she kissed him on his forehead. Later in life, he was asked, what inspired you to become a painter? And he said, the kiss that my mama gave me made me want to be a painter. You know, moms have a special touch. And what a blessing a mother is. I'm so thankful for all the Christian mothers that I have here at Fountainhead. I appreciate you guys keeping me straight. But, you know, when I think about mothers, I always am... Uh, drawn to Proverbs chapter 31. And I want to read just a couple verses. Proverbs chapter 31, verses 25 and 28 says, Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. In verse 29 and 30, many daughters have done well, but you excel 
them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Mom, thanks for loving your kids. You know, and, and thanks for most of all, teaching them who they should keep their eyes on and who they should focus on in this life. And his name is Jesus. I appreciate you guys. And now I want to go ahead and get into the lesson. James chapter 1 verses 13 through 18 is where we'll be. The title is, Who's Tempting Me? And I want to begin in verse 13. I want us to focus our attention to what James says. He says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. What is James trying to teach us? Now, remember, and I'm going to probably say this as we continue to walk through this, but I want us to really pay attention to this thought that the book of James is a very dangerous book. And why is it dangerous? Because as we continue this series on building a godly life, this is exactly what this book will do. Because it brings us face to face, face to face, with real life situations, temptations. I don't know about you, but I'm faced with temptations quite often. Now, that is a real life situation, and it calls, if you really pay attention to it, if you'll open your eyes, and you'll open your heart, and you'll open your hearing to the Word of God, what it does is it makes you consider your life. And if you take it serious, it challenges you whether or not you need to really make a change or not. Today's lesson is a perfect example of that. The purpose of this verse, the purpose that, uh, of James writing this verse through inspiration is to take away any excuse for yielding or giving in to sin. Yeah, we're going to talk about some sin the struggle of humanity stated here, it goes all the way back to the beginning. You know, uh, in Genesis, we see Adam. Uh, what does he do? He blames Eve uh, for his sin. And then, uh, and I'm going to just say this too. I've got a couple big words in here that I've uh, looked up and I know the teachers are going to be so proud of me because I know school's out, but I've been looking up some words and I've been doing some homework and I wanted to write some words that may be encouraging to you. Not because I'm really smart, but because I love these words. But Adam has the audacity to try and blame God as well. Look at the verse. You remember God comes to him and he says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? And what does the man say? <laughs> the woman who you gave me did it. She told me she gave me of the tree and then I ate. The woman whom you gave to be with me. Why did he do that? If we threw all the excuses out and we really thought about it, and we really considered our life, who is to blame for our temptations? Is it God? Is it Satan? Is it someone else? Or could it be us? The first thing to consider this morning is exactly that, temptations. The Greek word here means to try or to go about. It's this thought of enticement to sin. James is aware that trials... Bring a, and here's another big word for me, myriad. It brings a countless number of temptations. If you face trials in your life, you're going to face temptations. If you've got temptations presented before you, you're probably in some type of trial. But it's going to happen. Notice the word in verse 13. It says, let no one say when he is tempted. Temptations are a reality in life. But here's where it gets real. Here's where this awesome fruit begins to come out. While huge temptations are going to come in our lives, James wants us to remember one huge thing. 
It's not God causing it. It's not God causing it. In this verse, and we, uh, and really the ones following, uh, we are taught something incredible about God. That he can't be tempted by evil. It's not possible. The Greek word here where it says, uh, let no one say, verse 13, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted. The Greek word right here means not temptable. It means untried. God is untried. It's not happening. And this is a powerful thought. And this is one that we must put in our hearts. See, what's happening right here is we're gaining some knowledge. And you remember what we do with knowledge. We store it up in our hearts. So then when the problem comes, then we apply that understanding to the situation. Here's the truth. Here's the reality. Our God is not an evil God. Why would our God... The God who loves us so much tempt us with the thing that he hates. What does he gain by doing that? Consider a couple things with me. He has no wants. He has no needs that need to be satisfied. Uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 24 and 25. Look, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. God doesn't need anything. He doesn't uh, want power so that he's allured to do evil to gain it. Isn't that what we do, though? By any means necessary. I mean... I might do that, but I don't really want to. But if it's going to get me where I need to go, then I'll just tell that lie, right? God doesn't work like that. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head over all. God doesn't need anything. He doesn't need power. He doesn't need wealth. I read this just the other day. He has infinite resources. Look at this one, talking about the animals. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the beasts of the field, they're mine. Think about that. Every animal is his. What about happiness? He doesn't want happiness. Look at Jeremiah 32, 41. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good. I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. You remember what Jesus said in John 15, 11, These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Think about all of those verses. Why would our God, the God who doesn't need anything, the God who loves us so much, tempt us with evil? Nothing can be presented to God to entice him to use evil to benefit himself. So is he just doing it? So then it begs this question. Is he doing it just to be mean? Is he doing it just so he can get the, uh, the uh, what do they call it? Where they get the, uh, what do they call that thing? The, where you look at it, the uh, magnifying glass. You get the magnifying glass and then you let the sun come into the magnifying glass, right? What do you do? You start out trying to burn that leaf, but then what do you do? You start looking for them ants to start trying to burn up, right? Is that our God looking for a reason to try and hurt us? Seriously. But what does Satan do? What do our minds do? We immediately, when trouble begins to lurk, we turn against the one who loves us the most. The one who sent his only begotten son to die for you. 
He wants to set up evil traps to the ones that he wants to save from the evil? I don't think so. Why would tempting us to do evil do something, uh, be something that God who loves us would do? How does it benefit him? Here's the truth. Here's the reality. God cannot be tempted by evil. So God doesn't do evil. See, it's not even in his nature. So when those thoughts, when those considerations, when those uh, things come up in your mind that God is against you, throw them in the trash. God wants to help. God wants to protect. Isaiah 55, 11. I had to show it to Danny before we even started because this verse, this verse, the Lord will guide you continually and will satisfy your soul when? In the drought. And he'll strengthen your bones. And look at this one. You shall be a watered garden. And like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. My parents have a pond. And you know that pond always stays full. You want to know why that pond always stays full? It's because the spring's feeding it. That spring is feeding that pond and it stays full. This is what our God wants to do for us. He wants to guide us continually. He wants us to be a watered garden. Like a spring of water who does not fail. That's our God. This should bring us comfort, huh? This should bring us uh, peace in trials and temptations of life. Yeah, they hurt. Yeah, they are a struggle. Yeah, sometimes they cause us to uh, waver and be confused and not know uh, what to do in the moment. But to blame God, to be mad at God, to say that God is pushing this on me so I can do the wrong thing is not the way our God works. Now, does he allow these things to happen? Absolutely. Now, why? Because he wants you to know this truth. Who is going to help? We're going to talk about this more in just a few minutes. But if temptations aren't coming from God, where are they coming from? Who's really to blame? Temptations don't come from God. Where do they come? They come from. From us. What? Wait a minute. Let me look at my note. Yep. If God's not to blame, then it has to be Satan, right? Not us. You mean Satan isn't the cause of temptations? I thought he was the problem. You see what we do? We want to blame everybody else. We want to put it on somebody else. Today is the day of reckoning. James is a dangerous book because it takes out all the distractions and all you're left with is you making the decision. See, I thought he was the problem, not me. But look at what verses 14 and 15 say. But each one is tempted when, y'all? When he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. I know school's out. I know it's out. But James is about to take us to school. And you know what he's about to describe? He's about to describe the anatomy or the study of the structure or eternal internal workings of sin. Now, watch how awesome this is. James is going to use a fishing and or a hunting illustration to explain how temptations work. The first thing is this. We are drawn away and enticed by our own desires. Let me draw the picture. This is beautiful. This is incredible. If we didn't have the desires and the weaknesses then Satan wouldn't have anything to put on the hook. You see it? See, if we didn't have those weaknesses, if we didn't have those desires that are evil, then Satan wouldn't have anything to put on the hook. Hmm. Satan 
is the one that puts the bait on the hook for sure. And he's the one that drops the line in the water for sure. But the temptation comes within us. Because why? We want to take the bait. You know, fish have no interest. I, I fished. I know about fishing. This may surprise y'all, but actually I'm a decent fisherman. But I'll go fishing and I did it for a long time. And I'd fish everything in my tackle box. Worms, crickets, uh, jigs, uh, spinner baits. I'd get all these things out, all this stuff that I thought was going to catch these fish. And you know what? I didn't catch nothing. That is until I brought out my red rooster tail. Now the red rooster tail would always pull me through. I'd use it at the, this, the very last second. If I hadn't caught anything, if it was a bad day, I could always count on my guy, the red rooster tail. I'm sad to say that it got snagged in some wood and I don't know where it's at, but I love that red rooster tail because as soon as I threw that thing in the water, you want to know what happened? It got hit. And now I may have been a little small bluegill, but you know what? I caught something that day. I caught a fish. A temptation only becomes effective and intense based upon our own desires. You see this? The, our problem with sin is us. If we take away the blame and we start to deal with where the problem is, then we can fix it. Our desires are what Satan uses to try and pull us away from God. See, that's why Romans 12, chapter, two, I mean, chapter 12, verse 2 becomes so strong and why I repeat it all the time. That's why having a transformed mind helps us in our walk with the Lord. We need to know what's being put on the hook. See, James makes you think. He describes a problem further as he continues this illustration. We're drawn away and enticed by our own desires. And then he says this, when desire has conceived, here's what happens. It gives birth to sin. Having been enticed, our desire uh, lead us to sinful action and sin is born. We act upon that desire we don't fight the desire. We don't turn the other direction. Why? Because that bait looks so pretty. Why does that fish hit it? Because he just cannot get over the fact that either this, uh, this something is getting in my property, in my area, or I'm hungry. And I got to take it. I got to deal with it. If we go and continue to bite the bait on the hook, we forgot what Colossians 3, 1 says. If you were raised with Christ, remember this one, brethren. If you say that you're a child of God and you've been raised with Jesus, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. But what do we do so many times? We don't remember these truths in the moment. We let them falter away and our faith just begins to float around and we be, begin to start drifting away. Hold fast to the anchors that God has set before us. If you're raised with Christ, here's what you seek, the things above. Now watch, we are drawn away and we are enticed by our own desires. And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And then the third thing, when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. When sin has free reign in our lives, it leads to death. It leads to spiritual separation. When we let sin repeat itself in our lives, we're not turning our, uh, to God with godly sorrow and we're not repenting of our sins. Sin grows and it grows. Have you ever been there? It's, it don't, it's quick. If you don't deal with it, it will continue to grow and it will continue to grow in your life until it will kill you spiritually. That's what James is trying to get us to see. 
By blaming God at the beginning, we take away the one who's really there to help us. That's exactly what Satan wants us to do. He wants to use our desires and he wants to put them in our face and he wants us to already push out God so then we deal with it the best way we know how. But here's the reality, Christian. Here's the reality, brother. Here's the reality, sister. Here's the reality, friend, who wants to become a Christian. Where is our help? Where does it come from? James just doesn't want us to be deceived about what's occurring. Look at verses 16, 17, and 18. He says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In verse 18 it says, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. That we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Evil and wrong is completely against the nature of God. Every good and perfect gift comes From God. Now watch this. James describes God as the father. And you know what that means? We're his kids. Now. The father gives gifts to his children. Why in the world. Would the father try to do harm to the ones he loves. Now. This is a phenomenal thought because Jesus even talks about this. Every good and perfect gift is from him. Watch what Jesus says. As a son asks for bread from any father among you, if a son does, will he give him a stone? Hey, dad, I need some bread. And then you go out there and give him a rock. (laughs) Or if he asks for a fish, you give him a serpent. Really? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Now, come on. Watch what Jesus says. If you then be an evil, talking about humanity, know how to give good gifts to your children. Those things are absolutely ridiculous. And you guys know that. So even sinful humanity is going to give good gifts to their children How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Really? Now that's our God. Who's my help? Where does my help come from? It comes from the one who wants to give me good gifts. He wants to give me perfect gifts. See, it's also interesting that James calls God the father of lights. This is a powerful reference to God as the creator of the sun, of the moon, and of the stars. And watch this. James does this for a reason. To show how God doesn't change. The sun, the moon, the stars, and the earth, what do they do? They've got movement, right? The earth's rotating and, and all of these things. And what does it create? It causes shadows. Now... The earth turns, the sun gives light, but there are shadows that are caused due to this shifting by the creation. But with God, notice what he says, uh, every good and uh, perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God has no variation. God has no shadow. That's caused due to moving. Now hear it. In the trial. In the temptation. In the struggle. God does not shift. God does not change. What's the point? God only wants to give good and perfect gifts. That's it. God's not trapping us. He's not tricking us. Look at what verse 18 says. It drives the point home further. Of his own will, he brought us forth. How? How did he bring us forth? He brought us from a terrible situation and he brought us forth to a beautiful situation. And how did he do it? By the word of truth. 
that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He wants us to be the best. If I'm making something, KP helped me yesterday make some carpenter bee traps. Now, I didn't go over there and say, you know what? I just want to just do it kind of good. I, I don't really want to do it the best. And actually, it can be terrible. No, I wanted to make them the best I could, right? Why? Because I wanted those bees to go in there and get trapped so they don't keep eating my deck up, right? I wanted to be successful. Don't you think God, who loves us so much, wants us to be successful? Why would he set traps so we would be hurt? That's ridiculous. That's not our God. Let me plead with you, brethren. If you're weak and you're struggling, don't forget where your help comes from. It comes from the Almighty who from the beginning made a way. And it came by way of his son, Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget it. He loves you and he cares for you. And he wants to strengthen your bones in the toughest of times. God gave us his word of truth that brings life, that brings salvation to the world. And he did it of his own free will. He did it because he wanted to. Why would God then want to present evil things to the ones that he's wanting to save? That is a confused, ridiculous God. That's not our God. Why would he want to tempt us with the one thing that he wants to save us from? You see it? You see it? Oh, I love James. I'm thankful for what he wrote. I'm thankful for the encouragement. As we wrap up, I want us to think about this. Only good comes from God. He's our gift giver. His goodness never changes. And when we're tempted by our own desires, we must realize we may need to change what we're desiring. What are we desiring? What are we thinking about? What is pulling us in to do the wrong thing? What is it? I don't know about you personally. I can only deal with my desires. Are they the right things? Am I desiring the right things? See, we must take a moment and think about what they are. And begin to change the ones that aren't right. Because if we don't, when we become weak, we'll take the bait. Satan's been at it for a while. But see, if it, our desires are the right way. You remember he tried to tempt Jesus? What did Jesus do every time? He fought it back the correct way. He fought it back with the word of truth. Man, what an example. We must let the word be our guide and remember this. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes by hearing, right? And hearing by the word of God. I want to close and let this be your verse this week. Look at what God says. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us this. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. There's nothing new under the sun. But God is faithful even though you're the one that has these desires, even though you're the one who's creating this, this bait, God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. <laughs> he thinks above and beyond for you. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That's our God. He wants you to be a well-watered garden. Why don't you let him? Why don't you open this up a little bit more this week? Why don't you meditate on this just a little bit more this week? Why don't you pray to him just a little bit more this week? Here's the truth. God loves you. And he wants to help you. He wants to be there for you. Let him be who he wants to be in your life. Let him be the Savior. You remember Moses, he goes to Pharaoh and he says, what do I need to tell? Who do I need to tell him that sent me? And God Almighty said, I am that I am. I'm everything. 
I'm your joy. I'm your happiness. I'm your strength. I'm your shield. I'm your protector. I'm your friend. I'm your father. (laughs) Maybe you're here. Maybe you're listening this morning. And you are struggling. Maybe you need prayers. We can pray with you. Maybe some things are happening in your life that need to change. Call the building. Leave a message. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. Leave a message on Facebook. We would love to reach out to you and talk to you. But maybe you need to obey the gospel. Maybe you need to become a child of God. Today is the day of salvation Jesus Christ could come back at any moment. This is not just something that I've been taught. The elders wanted me to. This is the truth. We don't know the moment that Jesus is going to come back and get his children. Don't you want to be a part of that family? You can do it by obeying the gospel. Believing who Jesus is. That he did come. That he did die on a cross. And that he was buried. And that he was raised on the third day. You do it by repenting of your sins, turning from your way of living and saying, you know what, this is not the way, but your way is. Your word is the way that I need to live and I need to obey it. You do it by confessing that he is the son of God, just like the eunuch did. And then you do it by being immersed in water, baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you are added to his family. And Jesus said, if you remain faithful, you will receive a crown of life, a crown of life. Of life, man, if you need something, if you need prayers, if you need to obey the gospel, please reach out to us. Thank you guys so much for listening. Happy Mother's Day, and you guys have a great, great afternoon. This morning with Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To him that overcometh a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. Let us pray. Kind of love Heavenly Fathers, we conclude this service today. We are, again want to thank you for all the great blessings that you have brought our way. And dear Lord, as, as uh, we conclude today, we pray that you help um, each and every family that is viewing this today and worshiping with us to help us uh, in times of temptation. We all indeed have our desires. And dear Lord, when we're not Uh, paying attention when we're not watching as we should Uh, these desires can overcome us and lead us to sin we pray that that you just help us to recognize temptation when it comes our way help us to have the strength through our study and through our faith in you to overcome these temptations for indeed you have told us that you will not tempt us with anything that uh, we can't handle that Uh, you'll always find an escape for us. So help us to yield to the, um, to not yield to the temptations, but to deliver us from the evil one that uh, would cause us to do these things. Dear Lord, we continue to uh, pray for all that uh, need uh, your blessings on uh, this day and throughout the week. 
Uh, we, we pray that you be with our government leaders, our president, our, and various governors throughout the land and other leaders as, uh, as decisions are made of reopening our country and uh, help them uh, to have wisdom uh, with the timeline that they have. And likewise, we pray that you be with our elders here at Fountainhead and the elders of all of our congregations throughout the land as they will be reopening congregations uh, here in the weeks ahead. We pray that you give them wisdom and uh, our guidance in that and give us wisdom as we get back out to uh, do things that we would once do in our normal lives. Watch over us. We again thank you for Jesus who uh, you sent to die on the cross for our sins. And we pray that you forgive us when we do sin. Help us to be prepared for a home in heaven someday. In Jesus' name, amen.